Hello everybody, today I am afraid is going to be one of those sort of consumer advice videos about a relatively modern, relatively ordinary car. I am talking about the brand new Kia Xceed. And the Kia Xceed has given me a little bit of cause for concern. To date, I've generally enjoyed pretty much every single Kia product that I have driven and I have felt that the range currently offers a pretty balanced and decent selection of cars to fit more or less every single conceivable need. However, the Xseed marks Kia's entry into one of those most frustrating of marketplaces, the tiny crossover SUV looking thing which is actually nowhere near as practical as an SUV nor as fun sporty to drive as a regular hatchback. However, the sheer number of Audi Q2s and BMW X2s in the country means that that's evidently a lucrative marketplace and therefore I can't really blame Kia for wanting a slice of the pie. One of my main motivators for wanting to drive this car is the fact that I want to try and find a reasonable alternative to the BMW X2. I have no experience of the Audi Q2, but the BMW is one of the very few cars in existence which I truly hate. I had the misfortune of having an X2 as a hire car for about a day when I had to take my dad's car in to get some work done on it. The X2 is such a ridiculous car because it has the simplest of jobs to do. It's not going to be that sporty, it's not going to be that luxurious, all it needs to do is to cart you from A to B comfortably and with relative fuel economy and all that jazz. And it was just simply awful. One of the most uncomfortable cars I have ever experienced. I do not know how they quite managed it. And it pains me because I actually genuinely really like BMWs. I've in fact just bought another one which you may or may not have seen on the channel by the time that this comes out. However, that car was just awful on all fronts. It was also a very clear demonstration of a basic principle that I think is fundamentally correct. Never buy a cheap car from a manufacturer known for expensive ones. They very, very rarely work out. Take Mercedes as an example. I absolutely adore the S-Class, but I loathe the A-Class and generally the sort of the, the like graph, as it were, is pretty linear from A to S. This car is the opposite approach to the BMW. This is not the most expensive, but this is a relatively expensive car from a not entry-level manufacturer, but a more mainstream manufacturer. Kia have been on this sort of quality drive for quite some time now and have been trying to market themselves as a more upmarket brand. If ever you doubted their ability to be such, well, just try one of the Stingers or something like that. They really are absolutely fantastic. And I've spent most of this week driving around the E Nero. In fact, it's been a relatively busy time for me in general. That's one of the reasons that I am currently a little bit long of main. This particular Xseed is the first edition. It is, as you might expect, fairly fully loaded. Although you can pick up the entry-level Xseed from just over 21 grand, this thing is just over 29. Now, there may be a lot of you that simply go, what, 29 grand for a basic 1.4 petrol Kia? No. Well, this is the most expensive one that they do. And it is the same price as the cheapest BMW X2. It's actually quite a good looking car, I have to say, particularly in this shade that they call Quantum Yellow. I really do like it. I'm a sucker for yellow cars, and, and this one's got a bit of a sort of gold shade about it. If you're into your BMW yellows, particularly things like Phoenix that have got that kind of mustardy sort of tone to them, this is a car for you, or a colour for you at the very least. One styling cue I'm very glad that Kia have not adopted from their German rivals is this sort of obsession with doing something strange on the C-pillar. BMW put a little badge there, Audi put script there as well, and Audi have kind of made it like a, a matte piece of plastic, and it just looks weird. It's drawing attention to a piece of the car that doesn't need attention drawing to it. It's very, very odd indeed. On the interior front, it's 
largely recognizable Kia, but you can tell that this is a newer model. First off, they have learned the benefit of just a splash of color here and there. The yellow stitching on these seats really livens them up, and the, the little bit of color-coded yellow around some of the trims here does really make the place feel just that much nicer. Even a little bit of trim in the door here. It goes a long way to making this feel like a far less oppressive place, as does the sunroof which you get on the first edition models. And this is mentioned is a 1.4 litre petrol, it puts out just shy of 140 horsepower. The other engines that they had available for us to test today were the 1.6 diesel and the 1 litre 3 cylinder petrol. As it is, this 1.4 is fairly struggling with just two of us in the car, so I can't imagine that the 1 litre would be much fun in anything other than sort of urban scenarios. Most interestingly, according to the figures we've been given, this 1.4 petrol is actually torquier than the diesel by some sort of 15 to 20%. They're not amazing figures, and I do continuously wish that Kia would introduce a slightly peppier engine across the range. They, they do have a 2.0-litre direct-injection petrol, which would be great in something like this, but when they release those, they tend not to combine it with the luxurious spec. One day, maybe Kia will do this, but, well, I guess they probably know more about what people buy in terms of cars than I do, so there you go. This engine is paired with Kia's own 7-speed dual-clutch transmission gearbox, and I do mean that is Kia's own. I have in the past made the mistake of thinking that they must have bought their gearbox in, because that's what nearly every other manufacturer does, but no, this is their own creation, and I am very impressed at that fact. The view out of here is pretty decent, visibility is, is not too bad, rear three-quarter is a little bit obstructed, as you can actually kind of see uh, on, the, on this camera, but You've got a view of the bonnet, which is nice and not that ordinary these days. The A-pillar is not massively intrusive, and it's a nice place to be. Sunroof helps. Steering wheel is great to feel. Some of the updates in this car from the other Kias I've driven recently include the fact they have now adopted the virtual cockpit, which works in a very similar way to their other cars, to be fair. There's nothing sort of particularly revolutionary about it, but it's interesting to see features like this making their way into Kia products. You know, this is previously the sort of thing you'd only start seeing in really high-end German cars. They've also got a screen here which sadly is following the modern trend of starting to rise out of the dashboard, but it's not massively obtrusive. The virtual cockpit system here is simply nowhere near as good or as versatile as that that Audi use, and I think that the engineers at Kia are probably going to need to spend a little bit more time realising just how versatile a setup like this can be. If you get the virtual cockpit thing right, it almost completely eliminates the need for a separate screen down here. The one major victory of this car, compared with the X2 that I drove, is the fact that it is actually comfortable. I personally think it could actually be a little softer than it currently is. You can feel the bumps reasonably well, and there's a good chance that it would be better if we drove the entry-level model, which had only 16-inch alloys on it, versus the 18s on this. However, I can't complain for the lack of features in this car. It's got things that I've now come to expect from top-end Kias. And you have to remember, by the way, that when you buy a Kia, when you buy this first edition, and all of these things come as part of that trim level. Kia don't really do optional extras. So you've got electrically adjustable memory seats with heating, heated steering wheel, sat nav, Bluetooth, you've got the larger screen which you'd have compared to the entry level cars which have a sort of two inch smaller screen and they don't have sat nav as standard but they do have I believe your sort of Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, that sort of stuff. One thing which is really sadly missing from this car is any sort of paddles on the steering wheel and I don't know why because Kia have done it in other cars so it's a bit of an oddity. I also tend to like when Kia do perforated leather on the steering wheel, which is another thing that this car is missing, perhaps because it is, again, just a, a first edition and not the sort of GT Line S, which is Kia's normal nomenclature for their sort of top-end models. The seats are actually pretty comfortable. You've got LED lights in here, you've got reversing camera, you've got parking sensors, you've got DAB radio, you've got, realistically, everything you could conceivably want. Dual zone, climate control, all sorts. It's, it's a really well-featured, well-sorted, nice car. Unfortunately, from the driver's perspective, it does just lack a little bit. I've driven this 1.4 in a, a few other cars, and it sort of felt a bit peppier in them, so 
whether Kia are suffering, as all manufacturers are, from the increasingly strict legislature, I couldn't say, but it just doesn't feel as pokey as I would like. Now, it's probably not going to help the fact that I have spent the last week driving around their electric car, and electric cars do tend to feel quite peppy. It's also officially a more powerful car, 200 horsepower versus this car's kind of 140. This is reasonably lightweight for what it is. It's sub 1400 kilos, which is impressive when you consider things like the electric opening sunroof and the power tailgate. It's quite a lot of tech in a fairly small car. You've got enough room in the back for people, although it's not the best for sort of tall adults. If you've got four six footers in here, it would be a little bit of a struggle. As is tradition with Kia, the, the handling in it is actually pretty decent. It, it turns nicely, responds well, and it's an enjoyable thing to drive, which makes the, the omission of the paddles even more frustrating. All you have in terms of drive modes is a simple sport button. In some of the other keys I've driven, you get a selection of different driving modes. In this, it's simple sport or not. Uh, when you hit sport mode, it does change the dials here quite dramatically, and they look a little bit sexier and a little bit edgier, although in reality, they aren't actually showing you anything that you didn't previously know. Yeah, just... Like a lot of small turbo engines, when you rev it out, it doesn't really actually do any more than it already was, so I guess leaving the battles out isn't really killing it, but it is just a, a bit of a shame, really, that they aren't there. Even at sort of 25 mile an hour, put my foot down, oh, and it's making a lot of noise, but it's just not that quick. It's all right. Sport mode just basically makes it rev more than it needs to. So that's a bit of a shame because something like the Seed is actually genuinely exciting, especially if you get the Seed GT as a sort of sporty, fun car. It's actually properly brilliant, really, really good fun, and this one just isn't. But I don't know, maybe that was inevitable with the kind of audience that, that they were going for with this sort of car. Fuel economy figures are fairly decent. You get the standard seven year warranty you always get with a Kia, and genuinely, hand on heart, if you gave me the choice between an X2 and one of these, it would be the Kia every single time. And I don't feel like I'm biased because I'm on a Kia event. I've owned like nine BMWs. So, and at the end of the day, this isn't a car that is supposed to sort of get the blood pumping of a sort of certified bona fide petrol head. But if you just want something kind of ordinary that actually looks quite good and does the A to B bit with ease, it'll do it. If you're considering one of these, I have got my Tame Finance people at Pendle East to run some numbers as well. As with all Kias, I think you have to consider the level of equipment that you get as standard when you are comparing it with its German rivals, because if you don't do that, it may not appear like the best value. However, when you look at a real, genuine, like-for-like -like comparison, the Kia is still a very decent proposition, especially if you are intending on keeping the car longer term. Anyway, thanks everyone for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you for the next one, whatever it may be. Bye-bye.